Using your bulletin, let us remind ourselves we are in the presence of the living God. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing and give praise to God's name. Oh, praise the Lord with me. And so we have put on our Sunday best in terms of our smiles and our clothes, and we've come here to be God's family together. But we also bring each and every one of us the things that come out of our lives and the things and the places where we have fallen short, those things we don't speak of, and yet we bring them with courage to God, for we must clean our lives of these things we call sin so that we might be open to hearing God's word and being in this loving presence. I invite you to come and let us confess our sin together. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, 
the light of the world. And now, gracious and loving God, we come and we bring the things that have been in our life, the things that are in our hearts and in our minds, the things that make us feel shame. For we have not done what you have asked. We have crossed over it and gone the other side. We have been ruled by anger and selfishness for these things, specifically from this past week and chronically in our lives. We ask that you will hear them as they come from our hearts in personal confession. As we give these things to you, we feel the weight lifted from our emotions, from our spirits, indeed from our physical beings, knowing that you have taken them away in terms of your forgiveness and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose again for us. Christ reigns in power for us. I declare unto you in the name of Jesus Christ, indeed, our sins are forgiven. Amen and amen. I invite you to be seated, and I invite our young friends to come on up to uh, be with Mr. Todd. Good morning. So right now, obviously, we are at church, but but where we are, we're, we're, the thing that we're in right now is called a worship service, and the whole point of being in worship is to show our love to God. That's like what we're doing here, and that's what this time is all about. And so we can show our love to God anywhere and anytime, but this is a special time to be able to do that. Um, so I encourage you, as you are here for worship services, um, to sing along with everyone else who's singing um, as we sing praises to God, to pray as everyone else is praying, as we talk to God, um, to listen as things are happening in this service, um, to try and understand everything that's going on as we worship together. And I love to see, sometimes as I look around, and I see you worshiping, and I see you praying, and I see you singing. That's one of my favorite things to notice as I look out. 
um, and see you here worshiping with me. Um, but there are also times whenever we're here for worship services where you might want to worship in your own way. Um, and so we have some things that can help you do that. And I wanted to just spend a few moments with you today um, to share about um, a way that you can do that. So inside my bag today are more bags. Let's take a look. So these are called worship bags. And they are available um, in some bins just right outside the sanctuary door and then also in the back um, of the vestibule of this, um, this sanctuary. Um, so there's a little one, and those are good for younger kids. It has um, usually a book in it that you can look at as you worship. Um, it has an activity sheet that, that goes along with the scripture for the day that you can work on. Um, and think about what, what that story is going to be. A lot of the times the things we talk about are from the stories that you'll see in your worship bag. Um, uh, there's an opportunity to do some drawing on your Magna Doodle. Um, if you want to draw things that you see in worship or things that maybe a, as a way to draw a picture for God, there is a list of the worship order with little pictures. So if you kind of want to know, say, hey, we're singing from this hymnal book, what comes next? And that those pictures are here on that special card. Um, and even for you younger kids, there's even a little thing in here that you can point to what's happening as it happens in our service. So when we were singing, you can point it to singing. singing. And when we are praying, you can point it to praying. And right now, I'm going to point it to children's moment, because that's what we get to do right now. Um, so that's some of the things available for you younger kids. There's also more books on this shelf right out um, here at the sanctuary. You can pick a book anytime you want and bring it on with you um, to pick something that you would really like to do as you worship. Um, in the bigger bag, some of the same things. There's blank paper that you can use for some of the worship challenges that are here. Um, there's always a worship bulletin that you can do that goes with our story just like the younger kids. Um, but this yellow sheet... Um, it's something I wanted to, to make sure you knew about. There are five different things each week that you can do as you worship God. And so you can read these on your own if you're older, um, but you might need help from a parent to kind of review those with you and give you some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Your sibling might be able to help you. Even your, if some of you have youth age siblings that could help you. <laughs> Let's talk about that later. <laughs> so, so one on this sheet that I wanted to, so like a thing today, we're talking about how we use our words in the scripture verse. So it says God wants us to use words that are kind. Write down two things that you could say to someone that are kind and plan to do that today. Um, so there's always some, some activities that you can do um, as you worship. And, and as you do these things and as you participate in our worship service, you are showing your love to God. And that's what this time is all about. All right? So if you would join me in a word of prayer um, and congregation, join along with us. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for this time of worship. May we use it. To show, our love to, you to show our love to you in many different ways. In many different ways. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining me this morning. Oh, we thank you, Mr. Todd, very much. It's time for everybody either to go back to your family or go uh, to We One's Worship. And for the rest of us, we all know that God blesses us with many gifts. One of the greatest of these, of course, is the gift of God's peace, not just for ourselves, but it's even more... It is more powerful if we give it away. Therefore, I invite you to stand and greet one another and to exchange the gift of God's peace one with the other. Peace be with you. I'm glad I'm here too.
you, chatty Presbyterians. Before I uh, share today's scripture, I did leave one announcement out. I forgot to welcome back Phil. It's great to have him here with me. And so we all remember him, but thank you again for being here. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 10 through 28. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind, and if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Then Peter said to Jesus, explain to us the parable that says, people aren't defiled but what, by what they eat. Don't you understand yet? Jesus asked. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer, but the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all of her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. The grass withers, the flowers fade but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. This past spring, I had the pleasure of partaking in our church's first annual women's retreat. The theme of the retreat was Mary and Martha, and we spent a lot of time focusing on who we resonate with that story and why. To help with that process, Dr. Rebecca Morrison led a lesson about the Myers-Briggs theory where we were able to discover what personality type we may be within that theory. Some of you may be familiar with the Myers-Briggs theory, but to give the rest of you a brief understanding, the Myers-Briggs theory was developed by the mother-daughter team of Katherine Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers. It is a, an adaption of the theory of psychological types created by Carl Gustav Jung. We all had to take our own personality test, and my test revealed, or my results revealed, that I am an ENTJ. That stands for extroversion, intuition, thinking, and judgment. ENTJs are known as the commander, and it is one of the least common types out of the 16 Myers Briggs personality types in the world population. It is also the rarest type amongst women. Some famous ENTJs include Margaret Thatcher, Quentin Tarantino, Winston Churchill, Catherine Hepburn, Vince Lombardi, Julius Caesar, FDR, Alexander Hamilton, David Letterman, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi. We're noticing a theme here, right? <laughs> we tend to persist, we assume leadership roles, we're natural strategists, and we are very quick to see inefficiency. The focus of this story in Matthew is on the Canaanite woman. 
The word Canaanite holds much theological significance. To give you a little background, <clears throat> three women in Jesus' pedigree are um, three women in Jesus' pedigree are Canaanite women. There's Rahab, there's Tamar, and Ruth. In the Bible, the Canaanites are described as a large and fierce population. They were not easily defeated. It kind of sounds like that list of people I just read, right? When the woman approaches Jesus and his disciples, she makes a very personal request, one that affects a child. There is no story prior to this one in Matthew which connects this woman and Jesus and his 12 disciples at all. Yet she still addresses him as Lord, son of David. Then why did she think Jesus could help her? How did she know Jesus was the Messiah? Could there be an ancestral relationship between this anonymous woman and the Savior? What struck me right away about Jesus and his role in this scripture is that this is one of the scarce times we hear about the human Jesus rather than a divine life event. There is neither miracle nor healing performed right away. In verse 23, we read, but Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. It almost seems that the Canaanite woman caught Jesus off guard with her request. We have all been there, right? Not knowing what to say when, uh, when someone out of the blue asks us for help. I have lived in Winchester most of my life, and I am astonished I'm shocked at the high rate of homelessness in this small town. It has spiked within these last five years. And I'm not saying this because I read a study in the Winchester Star or new research in the Washington Post, etc. I know this because I have seen Watts, Winchester Area Temporary Thermal Shelter, grow from an idea to a saving grace. I witnessed the Monday night dinners at Braddock Street United Methodist Church, my home church, start as a fellowship opportunity for church members and beyond to a guaranteed weekly hot meal for the homeless community. There have been countless times when I leave this building to walk home and I am approached by strangers on the walking mall asking me for a few dollars. And I am stunned at the needs that surround us again and again. Like Jesus, I am left speechless. There was a period of time where I really struggled with how to handle these situations. I um, often have heard that working in ministry to not give the homeless community money, but opt to give them food. Though that is very good advice, my perspective changed when this topic came up in the senior high Sunday school class last year. The kids and I were discussing what to do when we are unsure of how we can help someone and one of the teachers, Tara Holmes, Holmes family, you got to relay this information to your mom. Tara said, she shined her wisdom upon us, and she said, you have to remember that when you help someone, you are giving them a gift. If I were to give you a gift, food or money, whatever, once I give it to you, it is no longer mine to care about. You do with it whatever you want. It's my gift to you. That piece of advice changed the way I give for the better, and I thank Tara for that. Earlier in this lesson, the narrative implies that one's race, ethnicity, gender, disability, or class does not defile a person. Hence our surprise to both Jesus' silence and his response to the Canaanite woman. Whether you are homeless, jobless, grieving, or just down on your luck, or just need a little mercy, anyone with an unrelenting need knows how horrible it feels when your request for help is met with dead silence. Now, Jesus did respond, but not right away. It was the disciples that spoke up first, urging Jesus to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all of her begging. Begging? 
I chose the New Living Translation interpretation of this text today because we clearly hear the woman saying, have mercy on me, O Lord. She is seeking mercy right away. Mercy, not food, not money, not new clothing, etc. But mercy. Still, the disciples urged Jesus to send her away, but the Canaanite woman, this anonymous woman, does not befall. Too often as humans, we cannot or even refuse to empathize with people whose walk of life is even slightly different than our own. If the oppression, injustice, or pain doesn't impact our race, gender, class, sexuality, etc., then we dismiss it as an unwelcomed, unjustified, and unnecessary noise. Jesus responds to this woman's noise. I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. I can't even fathom what the Canaanite woman must have been thinking at this point. Her daughter is still in need. No one has helped them. She came to seek Jesus. Her faith led her to Jesus. Is it possible that she could be thinking about the fact that her people's blood runs through his veins and that his people's blood runs through her veins? And yet Jesus, our Messiah, is still silent. Here, he is only human. If our common humanity, our relatedness, does not move us, what will? Nevertheless, the Canaanite woman persists. She persists just like Sojourner Truth, like Rosa Parks, Mother Teresa, Susan B. Anthony, she persists like Ava Perone and Anne Frank, Eleanor Roosevelt, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and more. She persists just like those of you amongst this congregation who are running on faith and mercy. She persisted. She didn't go away. She draws closer and kneels to Jesus, our healer. He can see her pain. He says, it isn't right to take the food from the children and throw it to the dogs. It is almost like he's trying to reconcile with her here. But she replies, That's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Yet again, Jesus is stunned by this woman and her faith. He says to her, Dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Canaanite woman is the commander in this story. I have wondered if Jesus' realization at the end of this story was simply a nudge from God. Even Jesus needed a nudge from God. Perhaps it is the faith that produces persistence. Oh, persistence. Or maybe we require persistence to fuel our faith. Either way, persistence and faith make a powerful pair. Friends, throughout my time here, I have experienced the greatest of faith. I have had nudge after nudge from God, and finally, when I could no longer ignore those nudges, the Spirit took over. As I begin this next chapter of my life, I foresee this as a new beginning, as a start of a, a long-distance relationship between myself and you guys, the First Presbyterian Congregation. I want to take a few moments to extend some thank yous to those of you who have been truly instrumental during my time here. First off, to the Chancel Choir. You were my first family within this large and loving church family. Thank you for your friendship, for your love, for all the cups of coffee you bought me on Sunday mornings. That's a good ministry, guys. But most importantly, thank you for your discipleship. I would also like to extend many thanks to Pat Byers and our fabulous director of music, Giovanna Reyes-Mir. Thank you for everything you all have done with and for this choir. Your music, your leadership, and passion have, gone un have not gone unnoticed. And I truly look forward to seeing what is yet to come for your time here. Some of you know that I was on the committee that hired Giovanna. 
I knew immediately at her audition that she was going to be a great musical leader for this church. But what I thank God for every day is that he helped us call one of my best friends to our church family. I would also like to thank the Handbell Choir for welcoming me into their family within a family, for nurturing my love of music, but most importantly, for really defining ministry in my life. I can't forget to thank the clergy staff that has just walked along my side during this time of discernment to Dan, Phil especially, Marin, and Rich Reif Snyder. I so appreciate all of your wisdom, guidance, and letters of recommendation and support that got me to this point. I hope that one day our paths will cross again. I would also like to offer words of thanks to the youth of this church. For it has been each of you that make me excited about Jesus. You have pushed me to be a better person. You have made me uh, lose countless hours of sleep on mission trips and lock-ins, but those were wonderful experiences that we shared together. I have seen the love of Christ shine through each of you, and I truly look forward to seeing you grow into leaders and young adults of the church. And last but not least, thank you, God. Thank you for this group of people I am among today. Thank you for introducing us. Thank you for calling me to do your work. Thank you for teaching me about great faith through your son, Jesus Christ. Friends, never underestimate the power of a persistent woman and the God in whom she believes. God be with you till we meet again, First Pres. Amen. Thank you, Kelly. Friends, it is time to come into conversation with God. I'd ask if you have any particular joys or concerns you wish to share with this, your church family, you do so now at this time. Well, seeing that a lot of you don't like to speak in front of crowds, but maybe it, um, uh, it's in your heart or in your mind, someone, or maybe it's yourself, in the places in which you uh, uh, need to be healed. We also want to include in our prayers uh, Lucas March, who was two years old and suffering from liver cancer, and also to all the parents who have sent their first-time, first-year college students away for the first time, both for the students and for the parents um, uh, who uh, get anxious about those things. Come, friends, I invite you to come before God. Let us go to the throne of grace. Let us go and bring the things that trouble us, but also the things in which we rejoice. Let us pray. Blessings don't need numbers, Lord. They need rememberings. From the way in which you have come and Listen to us in our prayers of thanksgiving, in our prayers of need. From the ways in which you have come and blessed us with gifts, spiritual gifts that come and fill us in, that strengthen us, that help us be whole and yours. For the ways in which you send people to be the carriers of these gifts and of your healing presence. We thank you for them as well. And we thank you for our church family. We especially thank you for the ways in which we can reach out and be family within family, as Kelly remembers, and also to be yours. Together, to put together talent and resources, not just to praise you, but also to be about your ministry. And while we give thanks for these things, we also know it is important that we remember our own needs and those that we remember before you, those who are in need of healing of bodies and of minds, of souls and of spirits and of emotions. Come, Lord, come and provide this gift of healing. And if we are to be the vehicles of it, separately or together, come and show us the way. We pray for our country, for our president, and for all elected officials 
that come that they might do what is good and lead us in what is right for all. We pray for the governor of our state and for all of those who help us understand what it means to be your people together as we are concerned about all and share all. For all of the things that are in our lives, Lord, we lift them up to you, knowing that you care for us. We ask now that you would hear our words as we use that ones taught to us by our Lord as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I invite you to be seated. We have heard God's word. It is now time to respond with what you put in the plate, for this is your offering, not just of money resources, but also of your talent and your experience, of your time, of your gifts, your prayers, your promises to God that say, yes, Lord, this week I am yours to be used by you in my discipleship. Put that in the plate as we bring this to God.
Receive these gifts that we bring. Receive our very souls. Take them, Lord, that we might be about your work, your business, and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen.